So grab your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 7. Glad to see you all. Glad to be here. All right, so y'all ready? Get, to go to get, get some work done. We're going to have some fun. There should be, uh, should be a Bible close to you if you don't have one. Maybe pull it up on your phone. I want you to, to kind of root in, in Romans chapter 7. We're going to bounce to chapter 8 a little bit. Um, but Romans chapter 7 specifically. Now, we've been, we're kind of in the middle of a series, Romans 6, 7, and 8, talking about having a victorious Christian life. How do I, how do I walk in victory over my sin? How do, I, how do I walk in victory? Not walking in the lust of my flesh, but walking in the, in the, in the, in the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to get into some of that stuff again um, today. Um, but that's kind of where we are. So we kind of finished up chapter 6 last week, and uh, we're, we're free from the wages of sin, and uh, we have the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We, we looked at all that. But today we find ourselves in Romans chapter 7. Now, it's going to take us a couple weeks to get through Romans chapter 7. And so every week, we're going to find our way to Romans 7 and verse 24. So turn your Bible there, Romans chapter 7, verse 24. I just want to read this verse. Kind of set the stage because everything Paul says from Romans chapter 6 all the way through chapter 7 to verse 24 kind of brings it to a pinnacle of he's wanting victory over something. So Romans chapter 7 verse, verse 24, is everybody there say amen? He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? All right, so Paul comes to this whole conclusion. He says, I'm a wretched man. I'm bound to this body of, of sinful flesh, and he wants a victory from it. You can read that in verse 25. We'll read that here in just a few moments. But here's what I would like you to do is stand with me, Romans chapter 7. We're going to read the first six verses. We're going to pray, and then we're going to dive in, right? So Romans chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. Let's stand together. Verse 1, he says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over men as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren... Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for who you are. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that uh, we're able to open up your word. And Lord, that you're able to speak into us. Um, Lord, I pray that you would illuminate these first six verses of chapter 7. And Lord, while they're, they're heavy in doctrine, Lord, I pray that they'd be very practical for us today. And if there is anybody in here that does not know you as Savior, Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they would just submit and call out and ask you to save their soul. Lord, I pray for victory within the body. Lord, I pray for victory over sin and uh, just living a victorious life and what that looks like. Lord, I pray that you would unpack these verses. Lord, give us freedom to preach, freedom to hear and receive and live what we're taught. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. All right, so Romans 7, verse 24, he says, I'm a wretched man. I'm bound by this, by this, this, old, this, this, this law, this, this, this man, this old man. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he says in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, so that with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. All right, so he's, he's laying all this out for us that he wants victory from, this, the, from his flesh. And so the moment you meet Jesus Christ as your Savior, you become two people. You have an old man nature and you have a new man nature. And God has separated you from the old man and is allowing you to walk in a new nature. Right? That's what salvation is. That's what it does for us. Now, he gives us a couple of analogies in verses, uh, in chapter, in verses 1 to 3. The first analogy is he talks about the Old Testament law. So look with me in verse 1. 
So he's getting ready to, he's writing to this church in Rome. He's specifically writing to the body of Christ, but he, he kind of narrows it down and says, okay, you in the body who grew up in Judaism, you in the, in the body who knows the Old Testament law, let me, let's chat about some things. So verse one, he says, know ye not brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. In other words, they know Genesis to Deuteronomy. They know those 613 Old Testament laws. Can you imagine that? Six, there's at least 613. That's conservative on the numbers. So if you went to Genesis 1 and walked all the way through Deuteronomy, and, and you would come and you would count about 613 different laws. He says, okay, I, we wanna, I want to talk to you guys. Because he says something in verse 1. He says, um, know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that, are, that, the, know, that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over men as long as he liveth. So every Jew, come on in, every Jew that's born, they, they are taught the Old Testament law from the moment they are born. And they understand that because they are born in, in, as Jews, because they're born into the Old Testament law, that there's no getting out of it. That the only way they can be, have favor with God was to keep the Old Testament law. Right? That, that's, that, that's the point that he's, Paul's making to them. He says, he says, okay, you understand that when you are under the law, you're under it until the day that you die. That's what he just said in verse 1. You are under the law until the day that you die. Can you imagine having to wake up every single day trying to keep all of those laws and knowing that you can't do it? Waking up every day saying, I, I know I can't do it. I'm going to try my hardest. I'm going to do my best. And here's what they would do. They said, okay, here's the Old Testament law. There's no way I can keep it. Let's make it a whole lot more stringent. That way, if I'm, if I'm really, really careful. So they took the Old Testament law and doubled it. And, and they said, okay, we'll make it even harder to obey the law. That way we will never go wrong. Well, the, they sin every day. Right? They sin all the time. They broke the law. And maybe you're thinking, well, I could keep that Old Testament law. Oh, really? Could you? Have you ever wore a cotton polyester blend? Well, if you did, then you broke the law. Men, have you ever shaved your face? Then you broke the law. Um, your goose is cooked. I don't know what to tell you. Right? You have to do the all, and those are just silly ones. Right? There are <laughs> numerous laws. And the point he's making to them in verse 1, it says, the only way you're going to get out from underneath that law is to die. You're stuck. You're not going to get free from it. Never going to get any victory from it, from the Old Testament law. So check this verse out. Check this out. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. Galatians 3, verse 10 says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the what? It's called a curse. The law is equated to a curse. So every Jew that's born, they're submitting to the law, and it's a curse to them. That's so he says, for it is written, curse is everyone that continued not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So the law is a curse. And not only that, you are cursed if you don't continue in all of it. So all the Jews in the room, when they're hearing the book of Romans read, they're going, yeah, that's the truth. It is a curse. There's no way I could ever keep that law. Verse 11 says that, but that no man is justified by the law on the side of God. Even if you could keep the law, you're still not justified. Because all your works are, as, all your righteousness are the filthy rags. Right? You've all fallen short of the glory of God. Even if you sin once, you're done. It's over. It is that for why? Because the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk chapter 2. All right, so look at verse 12. And the law is not of faith. Why? Because the law is a work, isn't it? And we're not saved by works. But he says the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. That's the whole point. So he says in verse 1, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them which that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Oh, you don't want to keep the law? Then you've got to be dead. That's the only thing that's going to separate you from that. That's the only thing that's ever going to give you victory over that. All right, so now let's, let's shift gears because we're, we're building something. So keep that analogy kind of on the back burner. That you're never going to be out from underneath the law. You have to die to it. And then he shifts gear in verses 2 and 3 and says something pretty crazy. That a lot of people like to run to this verse, run to this passage, and try to teach a lot of things on marriage. And he's not trying to teach on marriage at this pa passage. He's trying to illustrate something. So verse 2. He says, For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. 
But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. All right, what in the world is going on there? Well, she's laying out, or he's laying out this, this analogy. She says, okay, you want to get out from underneath the law? Then you got to die. You want out of your marriage? Somebody's got to die. That's the point. That's the point. That, that's, that's the point that he's laying out, laying out here. So here's the illustration. This is not a passage on divorce and remarriage. This is not a passage on any of that. He's laying out the idea that um, we are free. To get, all right, here's the point. He said, when you meet Jesus Christ, you are bound to this filthy, rotten carcass. And the only way you're ever going to get victory from it is to die. Right? That's the point. He uses the law as an illustration for that. And then he uses marriage as an illustration of that. Have you tracking with me so far? That's the point. So here, here's how this works. Is my wife in here? Awesome. <laughs> so imagine that I'm in my house, sitting back, watching a football game in the living room, in the recliner. That just sounds awesome right about now. And my wife comes in, and I can just tell that there's a little pep in her step, and she's really excited. And she comes in, and she goes, guess what? I got great news. And I go, oh, yeah? What's the, what's the great news? She goes, I got married. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like 19 years ago, we got married. <laughs> what, what's, no, no, I got married today. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. She goes, no, no, I, I met another guy, and, and, and we got married today, and I'm going to be married to both of you. <laughs> nope, that ain't going to fly. <laughs> that ain't going to fly at all. In fact, there might be something in my house that might fly <laughs> if she comes in my house telling me something like that, right? And no, because this passage is not dealing with divorce and remarriage. This, is, this passage is dealing with a woman who wants to be married to two men at the same time. All right, so what's the point? He's saying you can't be married to your old who you used to be and be married to who God says that you are and be married to both of them. Now, one of them has to die. That's the point. I'm telling you what, if my wife ever comes in <laughs> and says, hey, I'm married, I'll remind her, we said a covenant. We have a covenant of marriage. We both said, I do, until death do us part. And you're not stepping in and bringing somebody else into this mess. Ain't happening. One of us is going to die. <laughs> Amen, guys? Amen. That's the truth. That's just how it's going to be. I ain't playing. And my wife would never, ever do that. Amen. Ever. She would never do that. But that's the point. That's the point that he's laying out. He says, you want out from underneath it? There has to be a death. Oh, you want to marry somebody else? There has to be a death. All right, let me just say this. Now, what happens if I die? God forbid that I would die. I'm no longer able to keep my side of the covenant. That marriage is now over. She would be free to marry somebody else. Now, Carol would tell you she would never do that. I don't care. There better be somebody come alongside her and do the work with her. Right? But can I just be honest? This happens to women more than it happens to men. Because men tend to die early because we're stupid. Right? Yeah. Thank you, Bert. <laughs> but I've also seen this where a, a woman's been married to a man. Awesome, awesome marriage. He dies. She's lonely. Goes and gets married to another man. And yet is not really married to this man because she's still married to this one even though he's in the grave. She could just never let him go. And it's brutal on this next guy. That... He feels like his wife's cheating on her with her former husband, who's dead. And it happens, guys. It happens. Because there's still a tie to it. And that's the point that Paul is making. No, no, no. 
You are now free to be married. But you have to let the dead be dead. And that's the point. If you're ever going to walk in victory, there has to be, there has, the only way you're getting out is if something or someone dies. And that's why Paul says, I'm crucified daily. That's why I die daily. That's why, that, that, that's why I'm, I cannot allow myself to walk in the, in the wickedness of my flesh. All right. Look at verse 4. Because verse 4 lays out for us, and this is where I want to spend pretty much the rest of our time, is in verse 4. So based on these two analogies he gives us in verse 1, verse 2, and verse 3, he says in verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. So you see that in verse 4? He says, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. All right, so he says in verse 1, you want to get out from the law? You're going to do that until the day you die. Well, then in verse 4 he says, you already died. Why? Because in Christ, because he died your death, you have died. Amen? That's the point. All right, so we looked at Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. Look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. So verse 10, 10 through 12 says, though the law was a, was a curse. And anybody that was in the law, they were, they were just submitted to that curse. They could never get out from it until the day that they died. Well, verse 13 says, no, Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. said, okay, you are cursed, I'll become your curse. I'll become your sin. I will take it all upon myself. I will accomplish it. And then he says, for it is written, curses everyone that hangeth on a tree. I think you can read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 21. So he says, I'm going to take it all upon myself. I will die your death. Now you are free. Now you're free. You don't have to be bound to that Old Testament law anymore. Now, look, now this might seem weird to look at this passage, but I, and I'm going to encourage you to write some notes down on this. Because Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 to 17, help you understand how your Bible lays out. All right, everybody tracking with me so far? This might seem like a strange passage, but we need to come to this. Because he says, I, look what he says in verse 4. In verse 4 he says, Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. So you're being submitted into the body of Christ because he died, you died. Now you're free from that Old Testament law. Now you're able to walk in newness of life. Right? You read about that in Romans chapter 6. So he says in Hebrews 9 verse 15, let's just walk through this slowly. And for this cause, he, that's Jesus, is the mediator, the go-between of the New Testament. So you have a New Testament. And then he says that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions, we're under the First Testament. When you think First Testament, I want you to think Old Testament. I want you to think law. All right? So the First Testament, which they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. All right, so what did he just say? You have a New Testament, and you have an Old Testament. What happened to the Old Testament? Jesus died, didn't it? That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. There was soul under sin. All those sins that you read about in the Old Testament are now dealt with under the, under the blood of Christ at the cross. Right? Now look at the very next verse. Verse 16 says, For whereas a testament is... There must also of necessity be the death of a testator. That just helped you understand your Bible right there. There must be a death of the testator. Why? Verse 17, for a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is no strength at all while the testator liveth. How many of you have a last will and testament? One, two, some of us need to get after it, right? Do you have a last will and testament? Me either. I got to figure that out. Anytime we go on a trip, we sign papers and make sure our kids are going to go here or here. The house payment's going to go to somebody. <laughs> right? But here's the deal Bert has a last will and testament. And that may be notarized, it may be legal, but it's nothing but a piece of paper until the day he dies. This is just a piece of paper. And here's the, here's the thing. Um, will and testament changes all the time. I'm going to leave you this. I'm going to leave you this. Oh, you did me wrong. You're out of my will. Scratch you out. Well, you can't do that after you're dead. 
So the whole point is a, a last will and testament does not go into effect until death. The Old Testament does not go out until Jesus Christ dies because that ushers in the New Testament. Is that, everybody tracking with that? So that's why you're reading the Gospels. It sounds very Old Testament, doesn't it? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's all the stories about Jesus and they're submitting to the law and they're washings and they're, they're doing the sacrifices, they're doing all these things. Why? Because it's an Old Testament book still, even though it's in the New Testament. Because Jesus hasn't died yet. It's after he dies and rose again. That's when the New Testament ushers in. Well, unfortunately, there's a whole lot of believers that still want to be living in their sin. They still want to be holding on to who they used to be instead of what or who God made them to be. They will not let it go. They want to be married to both. And the Bible says you're acting like a harlot. He uses stronger, or stronger language, but I'm just not going to say it. It says you're acting like an adulteress. Where you're, you're cheating on both. You can't do it. You cannot be married to both. So the point is that Jesus Christ died to set you free from your sin. That's what verse 4 says. Look at Romans 7 verse 4. Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Jesus died to free us from the bondage of sin. That's why he died. Jesus Christ died for, to free us from the bondage of sin. All right. But why? Well, here's why. Here's why. So that we could be married to the resurrected Jesus. Notice what it says in verse 4. Verse 4 says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Why? That ye should be married to another, even to him that is raised from the dead. You are now married to Christ. Now, that kind of freaks me out a little bit. I'm just saying, as a dude, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around. But because I'm a member of the body of Christ, I will be married to the bridegroom. His name is Jesus. That's the point. Why, why is he freeing us from this old bondage? It's so that we might be remarried to another man. I'm married to an old man. I meet Jesus. And now I'm married to a new man. So let's go back to the analogy again. Let's go back to verses 2 and 3 for a moment. We're not going to read it. But let me just kind of lay this out for you. So the husband that you read about in verses 2 and 3, he's the dominating one. He's the domineering one. He's the dictator kind of man. He's your flesh. He's your sin nature. That's what that first husband is. Now the woman that you read about in verses 2 and 3, she's the New Testament believer. The one that's under the blood of Christ. The one that is saved. And I would say the majority of the people in this room say, yes, I, I know that I'm saved. But there may be somebody in this room that does not know Jesus as their Savior. I'm praying that you are a mess right now and that God's working all over you. So that you will come to know Him as Savior. But then you have this other man that you read about in verse 3. Should we marry to a, another man? Well, who is that? That's the better husband. That's the loving husband. That's the protecting husband. That's the eternal husband. That's your new man. That's the Spirit of God dwelling inside of you. That's Jesus Christ. So the moment you meet Jesus Christ, your old man is done away with. Now you get to walk in newness. That you get to be married unto Jesus Christ. Now, a couple interesting verses. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. That's a commandment, by the way, dudes. Amen, ladies. And how do you love? He gave himself for it. How do you love? Sacrificially. Love is not an emotion. Love is not words. Love you. No. Love is sacrifice. Love is willing to die. That's what love is. So Jesus died for his church. Now here's the crazy thing. The moment you get saved, you now become a member of the body of Christ. And because you are a member of the body of Christ, now you're a member of the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. So that's Ephesians 5. Or so we keep, keep going in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 29 to 32. He says, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. All right. Without giving nudges and without giving nods, ladies, you would agree with me, us men can be pretty selfish pigs. Yes. I said no nods. 
No nudges. It's true. We're very selfish. We care about ourselves. We care about our body first and foremost. That's just how it is. It's not right. It just we just are that way. It, the Bible just said it. We nourish it. We cherish it. But here's the amazing, even as the Lord, the church, you see that in the verse 29? Why? Because we are the body of Christ. That's why he nourish, nourisheth and cherisheth us. Now, verse 30. For we are the members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. Well, that sounds a lot like Genesis chapter 2 when Eve met Adam. Right? God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. God took the rib out of his side and formed Eve, that now she is a member of his body. We become his body in Christ. Have you tracking with me so far? This is important to understand. We got to get this. So what did, what did Adam say when he saw Eve? This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Same exact thing happens to us. The moment we meet Jesus Christ as our Savior, the moment we get saved, our spirit is now regenerated, our soul is renewed. In that moment, Jesus looks at us and says, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You are now my body. It's amazing. Oh, and guess what? Eve is called the woman, the womb man, the man with the womb. What is the body of Christ supposed to do? Reproduce. We bring forth children. Through intimacy with Jesus Christ. It's amazing, isn't it? No, we're still not done. In verse 31, he says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be, how many? How many? One. We ain't inviting anybody else in the marriage. Right? No wife coming home. I got married today. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> no, we're, we're one flesh. That's exactly what Roman, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 says, almost word for, word for word. Verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and His church. Your marriage is a picture of Jesus and His relationship with the Lord. Uh, sorry, Jesus and His relationship with the church. So the first point is that Jesus died to free us from the bondage of sin. The second point is he did that so that we could be married to the resurrected Jesus, right? Now check this out. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. He says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. I'm jealous over my wife, I'm just saying. Somebody starts hitting on my wife. I'd be hitting on them. It's just how it is. For I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I've espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That word espoused means engaged. The ring has been on the finger. Engaged. Now, in February 15th, 1999, Kofa Cheek Park, I bowed my knee and I asked my wife to marry me. In the same park that Raymond proposed to my mother in law. Aww. I couldn't come up with a better, it was just good. So we get engaged. What happens in three months if she comes to me and says, Hey, I got engaged? I'm like, Yeah, three months ago. She goes, No, I got engaged to somebody else. Well, then you're no longer engaged to me. <laughs> That's fine. You can go be engaged. Not to me. Right? So this kind of reminds me of, of Joseph and Mary. Remember when Mary shows up pregnant while being engaged to Joseph? What's Joseph's first thought? Who you been with? Because I know you ain't been with me. And so everything in him, the law says you die by being stoned to death. He doesn't want to do that, so he wants to put her away privately. So that she can go have the baby and she, he wants her to live, but he's getting ready to go off and do his own thing. And the Lord shows up and says, no, no, no. Um, she's not lying to you. That which is inside of her is the child of the Holy Ghost. Um, you're getting ready to give birth to your Savior. Oh, well, that's, that's different, right? So then they, they go ahead and get married. She is still now presented to him as a chaste 
virgin to Christ. All right, so that's the whole point, is that we are that chaste virgin. We are the bride of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Adam said, this is the bone of my bones. This is my body, and then they get married. That's how it works. That's exactly what happens with us. We get saved, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, and then we get married as the bride of Christ. That is hard for me as a dude to get my mind wrapped around that one. Ladies, you're like, oh, yeah, that's awesome. I'm going to be married to Jesus. Well, I'm kind of freaking out about it. But the Bible says in Revelation chapter 19 that when we get saved, or sorry, when we die, we go to the judgment seat of Christ. We're held accountable for what we've done for the Lord since our salvation. Then we're given robes white and clean. Ladies, you wonder why you wear white to the wedding? Because you're presenting yourself as a chaste virgin, saying, here I am. Robes white and clean, and then we are married at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's amazing to me. So why does God save us? So that we can be freed from the bondage of our sin, so that we can be married to another. Right? The third point. The third point is so that we can bring forth fruit that remains. So that we can bring forth fruit that remains. Keep reading in verse 4. He says that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto, unto God. She should bring forth fruit unto God. So the moment you get saved, as that woman, the bride of Christ, the womb, man, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, we should begin to bear fruit. Now here's how it looks. Gen uh, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. We know these verses, don't we? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against us. There is no what? Law. You're not bound by it. <laughs> You're free from the law. There is no law. Now, they're trying to make laws against these things today, which is kind of crazy to me, but it's happening. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Nine manifestations of one fruit. Nine manifestations of one fruit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Gentle. When you get saved, this should be evident in your life. If it's not, question. Have you quenched the Spirit or are you saved? There should be fruit in your life. All nine of these, not just one of these, not no, no, all nine at the same time. So there's there's this type of fruit. Colossians chapter one and verse ten says that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Everything I do, every good work I do, there should be fruit being born out of that, right? There should be fruit, no doubt about it. All right, so why does God give us the institution of marriage? Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image, in, in the image of God created him, male and female created him. The very, very thing that Satan wanted in the very beginning, to be like the Most High, God says, I'm going to create man and woman in my likeness and my image. The very thing that Satan wanted in the very beginning. And then he says, okay, I've created you male and female, binary, by the way. I don't care what colleges and schools are trying to teach you. Amen. This is how it is. There's male and female. Male and female. I don't know how we're having any other conversation about it. Now look at this. Verse 28. And God blessed who? The male and female. Right? Blessed them. And God said unto the male and female. Everybody track with me so far? This is how it works. It's like amazing. God put all the plumbing and it all works together. It's amazing. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. It goes on and on. So why does God give marriage? To accomplish his mission, right? Well, how do you do that? By filling the planet with spiritual sons of God in the likeness and image of Jesus Christ. That was the whole purpose of marriage. So God gives Adam and Eve together and says, okay, now I need you to have children. And not just a couple. I want you to have a lot. And then I want them to have a lot and them to have a lot. I want you to replenish the earth. Well, how can you replenish something that hasn't been replenished already? Satan's already taken two-thirds, or sorry, one-third of the angels with him. Right? The sons of God with him. So now they're restoring that. So they're replenishing the planet with spiritual sons and daughters of the king. 
So the whole point of marriage is that we would bear fruit, that we would bring forth more fruit. Amen? That's the whole point. Now, if true marriage, that's how it kind of works. Husband and wife come together, not long later, I'm with child, or there's a baby. Why? Because there was intimacy to bring forth child. Everybody with me? I'm trying to handle this with kid gloves. <laughs> there's certain things you must do in order to have a child. Right? Same thing is, how do you lead, a, how do you lead somebody to the Lord now? You have to proclaim the gospel. The Bible calls it the seed of the word of God. It has to go forth. The seed has to be received. And it germinates, and here comes, here comes fruit. Right? So, as a, as a Bible-believing Christian, you should be bringing forth fruit, and a fruit that remains unto the Lord. And the only way that you're ever going to accomplish that is by proclaiming the gospel. To have children. Spiritual children. Now, there are marriages where they can't have children. It happens. So what does that marriage do? They adopt. Right? They adopt. Well, that sounds a lot like Romans chapter 8 where we've been adopted as children into his family. Because every single one of us were born into the wrong family. We're all born into Satan's family, John chapter 8 and verse 44. You have your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He tells Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you must be born again. Right? Listen. It's a beautiful thing when, when a husband and wife come, and they come to a child and says, I choose you to be my member of my family. That's precious. Some, there's families in this room that know what that's like. There's children in this room that know what that's like to, to be loved, to be picked, and say, you're mine. That's special. To say, you are now my child. That's pretty amazing. And that is also bearing fruit, raising up fruit unto the Lord. Okay. So the why, why do we get saved? Well, because we're in bondage to sin, and God needs to free us. Well, why? So that we can be married Married unto him. Well, why? So that we can bring forth fruit and fruit that remains, John chapter 15. Right? All right, we're almost done. We're landing the plane. Come back with me to Romans chapter 7, verse 5. He says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, you want a definition of what it means, what the flesh is? It's the motions of sins which were by the law, did work in, the mem in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So you were in the flesh, verse 5. The end result of that is you had earthly, worldly fruit that was unto death. Romans chapter 8. Look over here in Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. He says, for to be carnally minded is what? What does it say? Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. Is death. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So this is who you were. You were in bondage of sin. And guess what? Now you have, you're able to be delivered to serve. In Romans chapter 7, verse 6. He says, but now, present tense, ye are, present tense, delivered from the law. What law? The law of the Old Testament law? No, the law of sin and death. That being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of the Spirit. And not in the oldness of the letter. So you were in bondage to sin, verse 5. Now you're delivered to serve, in verse 6. Well, that sounds a lot like Mark chapter 10, verse 45, doesn't it? Even Christ came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Why did Jesus Christ come? To serve. What should we do as believers in Christ? Serve. Have you ever met somebody who is the most selfish person you've ever met? And the moment they get saved, they become loving and giving and serving. It's like, who are you? I'm not who I used to be. Who I used to be is dead and gone. I'm married unto a new man. His name is Jesus Christ. And I'm bringing forth fruit of righteousness. And I'm no longer bound to my sin. And I have now liberty and freedom to serve. That is victory. That's the victorious Christian life. Amen.
So, Romans chapter 7, verse 24 and 25, and we're out. Let's stand together. Romans chapter 7, verse 24 and 25 says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. We have a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. Do you know Him? And if you do know Him, then you are now free to be married unto Him and to bear fruit, spiritual fruit, and fruit that remains. You are no longer bound to your sin. Now you're able to walk in deliverance and serve Him in newness of life. How amazing is that? That is true victory. Let's walk in that today. Amen? Now, if you are here and you don't know Jesus and you know that you don't know Jesus, grab somebody. Grab somebody you came with and say, hey, we need to talk. Would you show me how I can know Jesus Christ as my Savior? Do not leave here without handling that business today. Amen? Handle it today. Jason, will you close us in prayer and we will be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for your